Welcome everybody to the second session of our Bialik series, The National Poet. And you may remember if you participated in the first one that we called lamentation, that we called longing. This second one is called lamentation and there is yet a third one that we are all hoping to study together next week. More about that when we conclude our class today. Let me say a word of preparation. Of all the three sessions that I am presenting to you in this Beit Avichai series, the one we are facing today is the toughest one, the most difficult one, the saddest one. I am bringing it to your attention because it's crucial to Bialik's work, but it's above all crucial to the question that is leading all our three sessions. What makes a national poet? And I would like to repeat, to reiterate the questions that I have asked last time. If Yalik arrived to the land of Israel very late in his life and only lived here 10 years, if he never saw the state of, state of Israel come into being because he died in the year 1934, he did not even witness the Holocaust, those two major events of the 20th century of the Jewish people, what did he do? to deserve to become our national poet. So we gave a partial answer when we addressed himself or Bialik as placing himself in that rift between Zionism and traditionalism. And I tried to show you how these topics of the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, are still with us in well into our century, the 21st one. So let us continue with Lamentation, our second of three sessions. And in order for, to do that, we are going to look at two major poems. And you can see that the first one, I wrote the name in Hebrew in transliteration Al Hashchita upon the slaughter, because so many people know it in the Hebrew name, but we will look, of course, at the translation. And the second one, the city of killing or the city of, of slaughter, depending on the translations you are using. A quick review of Bialik times, we had that last time. So you have the birth, you have the date of his death, his yeshiva years, his years in Odessa and first visit to Israel, to the land of Israel, one should say, not staying at that time. Life in Germany after he leaves Russia, a, that becomes actually the, the Soviet Union before it became former, you remember that. Aliyah to Israel in 1924, and the major historical events of the time, the Dreyfus trial, the first Zionist Congress, the Kishinev pogrom, which is our topic today, the second Aliyah that follows it, you can already start guessing the connectedness between these two events. World War I, just to place ourselves on a universal timeline as well as the Jewish one. And now let us remember that our first session dealt with three poems that expressed longings in different phases. We looked at To the Bird, El Atzipor, the Talmud student called in Hebrew Hamatmid, and Levadi alone. Today, as we said already, we are going to look at Al Ashkita upon the slaughter and the city of killing Be'ir Hariga. And next week, we will talk about it at the end of the session and come back to it next week. Here is another timeline. This time, imagine that we are zooming in. Not only are you on Zoom, but we are zooming in into the particular timeline of the Im in the immediate wake of the Kishinev pogrom. So, first of all, pogroms have been there for many, many, many years before the Kishinev pogrom. I have placed among the many the Chemlinitsky pogroms. You can see the time, 17th century, almost 20 years of those, around the place called Nemirov. I will explain why it was important for me to state of all the many pogroms that we had in history, these ones, as we say, Dafka in Hebrew. There were Odessa pogroms, and Bialik is linked to Odessa in the years 8081, 1884. 
Then comes the Kishinev pogrom in 1903. That is the one we will be focusing on. And there were more in 1905 and lots of killings of Jews even during World War I. But our focus today is the Kishinev pogrom. This particular one has, sometimes it is difficult to explain why is it so outstanding among the many pogroms. So one of the things that you can state is that this is a pogrom that is reported by the New York Times and therefore it crosses the ocean and the language is such that the New York Times will not print it. So that reaches Jews in America at the beginning of the 20th century and it shows the terrible suffering of the Jews under the Tsar, under those events and the American president sort of talking to the Tsar and warning him of the need to pay attention to the safety of the Jews. The Sixth Zionist Congress, the one we oftentimes call the Uganda Con uh, Congress, is connected because the Kishinev pogrom is in April of 1903. In the summer of that year, the Zionist Congress, headed still by Herzl, the last one Herzl will ever had, he will die soon after that, is in the summer of that very same year. Why do we call the Sixth Zionist Congress the Uganda Congress? And how is that connected to the Kishinev program and to the poetry that we will be looking at? Because the Kishinev program, the program that was considered one of the most horrible things to happen, and we will look at the literature and we will look at the poetry, little did they know what was about to come. But then again, hindsight is something very easy, you know, when you come in later. Herzl, among other Jewish leaders of the time, is totally shocked by the pogrom. And therefore he, the person who wrote Judenstadt, the state of the Jews, the person who encouraged for us to go and create a sovereign Jewish state in the land of Israel, is starting to talk along another language. Europe is proving to be very dangerous and therefore we need a safe place for a night. The Hebrew expression that we use and we study in schools is miklat lelayla, a safe haven for the darkness of the night of the pogrom. And he puts in front of the Congress the proposition to go to Uganda until times will be right for the state of Israel. The Uganda in the land of Israel. The Uganda proposition never materialized, but it will show you how shocked Herzl and other leaders are that they are willing to give up on Zion, they are willing to give up on the land of Israel because Europe is perceived as dangerous and Jews need to go elsewhere for their safety. If you want to quote another Zionist leader, you can go to Jabotinsky, who starts talking about the term that he called evacuatia, the need to evacuate Europe. So here's another historical connection for us. Following the Kishinev pogrom, we will see one of the first self-defense organizations in Tsarist Russia. We will see the second Aliyah, that Zionist Aliyah, that will want not only to settle in the land of Israel, just like the first Aliyah did, the first wave of a, a immigration to the land of Israel at the end of the 19th century. These are the people affected by the Kishinev pogrom, affected by the death of Herzl in 1904. They will say it's time to create a state, it's time to create a new Jew. My suggestion to you will be that some of the ideas of what is the new Jew will emerge from the Bialik poetry that we are looking at today. Every single item that I'm putting on the screen for you today has a connection. The socialist revolution will happen after that in which many Jews will take part as a statement to say, we want to control our life, we want to control our future. And of course, the great immigration to the USA. And those of you who can trace your ancestry to people who came to America in the first or maybe the second decade 
of the 20th century, I think that if there is family law, it will relate to the Kishinev pogrom and its effect. All this come directly in the wake of the Kishinev pogrom. It's time for us, therefore, to place our two poems in place and start looking at them. Here's the first poem, On the Slaughter. It will appear you have the Hebrew date, a little bit confused at the bottom, but tough race Samach Gimel, Iyar, which is normally the month of May, the pogrom had happened in April. It happened in Easter. After the story, you know, of what happens to Jesus that people commemorate in Christian churches throughout the world in Easter, there, there is an incitement to go out and kill the Jews. Bialik is in shock, like everybody else. The year is 1903, and the town of Kishinev is not too far away from Odessa, where Bialik lives. Let's listen to a little bit of the Hebrew and start going into the first Bialik reaction to the pogrom, because there will be a second one. And we will be looking at the balance, at the comparison between these two reactions. The immediate one that Bialik will write a couple of weeks as the news transpire. You will note, of course, the news are a little bit slower in traveling than, than they are today. I'd like you also to note that a, as we are moving towards the end of the year 2022 and going into 2023, we will be commemorating or remembering the 120th anniversary when next Passover comes, when next Easter comes, we will be commemorating the 120th anniversary of both the pogrom and Bialik poetry that followed. Alashkita. שמיים בקשו רחמים עליי. אם יש בכם אל ולאל בכם נתיב ואני לא מצעתיו, התפללו אתם עליי, אני לי באמת, ואין עוד תפילה בשפתיי וכבר אוזלת יד, אף אין תקווה עוד עד מתי, עד ענה עד מתי. התליין, הי צוואר, קום שחט, עורפני ככלב, לך זרוע עם קרדום וכל הארץ לגרדום. ואנחנו, אנחנו המעט, דמי מותר, הך קודקוד ויזנק דם רצח, דם יונק וסב על כותנתך ולא יימח לנצח לנצח. On the slaughter. Mercy, O oh heavens, beg mercy for me. If a God be in you, with a way in you, a way that I never knew, pray unto him for me. My own heart is dead, prayer drained from my tongue. The hands lie limp and hope undone. How long? Until when? How long? Executioner, here is the neck to you. With your mighty axe, put me down like a dog. All the world's my chopping block. And we are just Jews, just a few. My blood is fair game. From the skull you severe, burst the blood of old men, the blood of children, murderous blood be on you forever. Let me stop here, and you can very clearly see that both in my reading of the Hebrew and my reading of the English, I stopped in the middle of the poem. I'd like to suggest that we have a clear division between the two parts. So let me therefore draw your attention to the first one. One could believe, at least with the first line, mercy, O oh heavens, beg mercy for me, that this is written in the style of classical, old age Jewish lamentation. Something terrible happens and you call upon heavens and you call traditionally upon God. And so, <clears throat> Bialik, you would ask, what's so new? <clears throat> you are writing exactly in the terminology of Middle Ages lamentations. Oh, no. 
all you need to do in order to encounter the modernity of the Bialik language. The Bialik that we have seen last week, the Bialik who left behind Bet Midrash, the Bialik that will not join the Talmud student in the yeshiva. Because immediately at the second line, if a God be in you, with a way in you, a way that I never knew. So the Kishinev pogrom is yet another opportunity for Bialik who already went through the process of checking his earlier beliefs and conduct and customs, of adopting a new way of life, the Zionist more secular way of life. Here is that Bialik placing himself, tagging himself at the very beginning. The remnants of the Talmud student are there. Mercy, oh heavens, beg mercy for me. Because what is a Jew to do when trouble happens? You call upon heaven. But the Bialik that we met last week is a doubtful one. If there is a God, then let the heavens pray for me because I cannot. Pray unto him for me. My own heart is dead. I cannot. And yet again, as you reach the closing line of this first verse, the prayer repeats the classical Jewish lamentation. Adana, Admatai, until when? How long? And then he goes further. Now he is addressing not the heavens, but the perpetrator, the executioner. Bevakasha, let's go, kill me. There is nobody who cares. We are just Jews, and you can do whatever you want. Go ahead, do. I think one could feel the agony. One could feel the despair. And what I would like you to start feeling is a sense of helplessness, because that will be the cause of what will follow. So Bialik gives voice even at the very beginning of On the Slaughter to the tension between the need to call upon a God that you do not anymore totally believe in and the inability to disconnect yourself from the tone of prayer until when, until when, and then the anger at the executioner and the anger of the helplessness of the Jews. What can we do? All the world is my chopping block and we are just Jews just a few. We are a few. We do not have the strengths. The year is 1903. And now we come to the last part, to the second part of this very same poem. And I'd like to suggest that the tone differs. And I'd like to suggest that we start hearing a voice that we will hear in different shapes in years to come. Let us listen first of all to Bialik, and then we'll make the connections. If justice there be, let now shine forth. But if it wait till I am killed from under the sky to shine, let justice die. And its throne be thrown to the earth, and heaven wrought with eternal wrong. Yea, wicked, go forth in this your brute force and live in your blood cleansed throng. I'd like you to listen again to this cry that I want to repeat again because it becomes so crucial to 20th century language much later. The im yesh tzedek yad. If justice there be, let it now shine forth. The now in English, the miyad in Hebrew, because if it comes later, I'm not interested. And I'd like you to move fast forward, way beyond Bialik, towards the last part, let's say the last third of the 20th century, where at two opposing ends and anywhere in between in the Jewish people, there are echoes of this Bialik call, the need for now. 
you will find within Hasidic circles, within observant, faithful parts of the Jewish people, the call for Mashiach now. We want Mashiach now. And on the other end of the Jewish continuum, you will hear the voices, Shalom Achshav. We want peace now. On both ends of the Jewish ideological continuum, there is this tiredness. Until when do we need to wait for whatever it is that we think is salvation? Mashiach on one side, peace on the other side. I'm not going into the political debate. I just want you to see how Bialik echoes this call for now starts in 1903 and will find reverberations much, much later. So let me now highlight, a, first of all, the title of this poem that echoes the blessing that we say when we are about to slaughter something. So Bialik maybe is mocking the custom, should I also bless? this particular slaughter, and I'd like to draw your attention to the now thing. And if it is belated, not interested. Thank you. And now we come to the last verse and probably the one most co quoted. Ve'aror ha'omer nekom, nekama kazot nekmat yeled katan od lo bara ha'satan. ויקוב הדם את התהום, ייקוב הדם עד תהומות מחשקים, ואכל בחושך וחתר שם כל מוסדות הארץ הנמקים. And cursed be he that shall say avenge this. Such vengeance for blood of babe and maiden hath yet to be wrought by Satan. Let blood just pierce the abyss and pierce the abysmal black of creation, and there in the dark devour and corrode the low earth rotting foundation. Let me start from the end. For Bialik, his reaction to the Kishinev pogrom is a doubt in the whole validity of earth's foundation. They are rotting. But it is important for us to see that oftentimes in political speeches, when a terrible terrorist act happens, when a terrible waste of especially young life happens, people will quote the line, Nikma kazot nikmat dam yeled katan od lo bara satan. Such vengeance of love of babes and maiden have yet to be wrought by Satan. And oftentimes the politicians, the speakers, the public speakers who quote this line tend to forget that Bialik did not say just such vengeance for blood of babes, etc., was not yet wrought by Satan. Bialik precedes his saying, and cursed be he that shall say avenge this. Bialik is not calling for vengeance. Bialik is calling for a justice to reset the foundations of the earth. And sometimes people who, who are knowledgeable in Bialik uh, will be upset when politicians so conveniently forget the first line of the last stanza, ve'aror ha'omer nikom, just listen to the Hebrew, how strong, cursed be he that will say, avenge this. Bialik is not calling for revenge. He is calling for a resetting of the universe. Oh my goodness, how much that was needed in that decade of that century, but never happened. So we are going to leave al-ashkita upon on the slaughter, upon the slaughter again, depending on translations that you are using, and we are continuing to the next one that will follow after a few months. In order to that, I'd like to introduce or to reintroduce to you a very famous Jewish historian, Shimon Dubnov. Shimon Dubnov is there in Odessa. You have the years, 
by that time, Bialik is not yet the great Bialik. He will become greater and greater, but pretty well known by that time. Known well enough so that he is chosen by the community in Odessa to go to Kishinev with some help, with a camera, to record, to listen to witnesses, and here is what Dubnov is saying to him. Ata te'abed et ha'chomer she'asafta be'atzmecha ve'al yedei achirim ve'tetair al yesodo t'muna historit mesuderet shel kol ha'meorah mitchilato ve'ad ha'yom she'anu omdim bo. You will edit the material you collected yourself and from others. You will then describe a well-organized historical description of the events from its beginning to this day. You and your assistant will present all the documents, the pictures, the sound, the statistics, the committee's minutes, and we will print your story as an addendum. This was the order. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to tell you, none of this happened. And we want to see what did happen. And for that, we are moving to another a PowerPoint presentation that will allow for us to look at the full text. So here is the Dubnov quote again in the second presentation. And let me say, uh, thank the people in the background, making sure that we have this smooth passage. Thank you very much. And now we are looking at the second much longer poem, as we are going into its reading, a few words of caution. First of all, we are not doing the whole poem. It's a very long one. I have chosen parts of it to include in your source material, and even those parts we are not fully reading. I will highlight parts that we are reading. Why? Because it's very long. Why? because some of the details are really very, very difficult, painful to follow. But let me just read the first lines of the Hebrew and then we'll move to the English and we'll continue with the English for the sake of time. The text is available for Hebrew speakers. Be'ira Riga. Kum lech lecha el ira hariga uvata el chatserot ובעיניך תראה ובידך תמשש על הגדרות ועל העצים, על האבנים, על גבי טיח הכתלים, את הדם הכרוש ואת המוח הנוקשה של החיילים, חללים. Arise and go now to the city of slaughter, into its courtyard when thy way. There with thine own hand touch and with the eyes of thine head Behold, on tree, on stone, on ferns, on mural clay, the spattered blood and dried brains of the dead. I know that the details are terrible. And yet I want you to pay attention to something that we need to be able to discern in our reading of the city of killing or the city of slaughter. As Bialik is sent by Dubnov, Remember, you will go, and you will collect, and you will do, and you will write. He didn't. But what he takes from the Dubnov order is the style. And he turns to his reader now. You will go. You will look. You will see. Because Bialik, although he connected notebook upon notebook of witnesses and testimonies and his own impressions, he never wrote that book. He wrote a poem instead. Much later research will publish the Bialik notebooks of the Kishinev pogrom. But at the time, he will write the poem in the city of slaughter. Because of fear from Tsarist censorship, the first editions of the city of slaughter or the city of killing was not called neither this know that it was called Nemirov Journey, Masa Nemirov. The poet, as well as the publishers, wanted the Tsarist censorship to think 
that this was about the Chemlinitsky programs of the 70th century. And only later editions assumed the original title by Bialik. So we see how the historian's command or mission statement for Bialik is now translated not in doing what he was told to do, to write a book, to collect all that. He's writing a poem. But in the poem, he adopts the command, arise and go now, kum lich. It's not him calling to heavens as we have seen in the first poem. It is him sending the reader to look. The other thing, and I will be reading this painful part again, there with thy own hand touch and with the eyes of thy behead, behold, three stone fence mural clay. Bialik has a camera. He can take pictures and his writing, the narrative line is as if a camera is looking at the different sites. So let's go with Bialik's camera as he sees everything. Let me give you another line. Proceed thence to the ruins, the split walls reach, where wider grows the hollow and greater grows the bridge. Pass over the shattered hearth, etc., etc. And he will describe all the pictures as if indeed he is holding a camera in hand. And he is. And the poem sort of repeats what the camera sees. We are jumping ahead and we continue on English. On wreckage doubly wrecked, scroll heaped on manuscript, fragments again fragmented, pause not upon this havoc. Now the instructions continue. Hello, dear reader. No, don't stop there. As bad as it is, I have something else to say, to tell, show you. Pause not upon this havoc. Go thy way. The perfume, perfumes will be wafted from the acacia bud, and half its blossom will be feathers, whose smell is the smell of blood, and spitting the strange incense they will bring. Banish thy loathing, all the beauty of spring, the thousand golden arrows of the sun will flash upon thy medicine. The sevenfold rays of broken glass over this thy sorrow joy, joyously will pass. For God called upon the slaughter and the spring together. The slayer slew the blossom's breast and it was sunny weather. Here we need to go back to the Hebrew, but not before I draw your attention to the exactitude of the time and place. If the camera, as it appears in the poem, records the terrible sights, the words will remind you of the time, of the season. This is after Passover. So therefore it's spring and there are all the blossoms and wonderful, you know, scent of spring. But pay attention between the blossoms' feathers of pillows and other beddings of the victims, everything is mixed. And now we come to these two lines that I want to highlight in this particular section. And I will read the Ivrit first and the English again. Kikara Adonai l'aviv v'latevach gam yachad. Hashem is zarcha, hashita parcha, v'ashochet shachat. Can you hear the chet sound, an unpleasant screeching kind of sound? For God called upon the slaughter and the spring together. If your ear is disturbed by the chet, zarcha, parcha, shochet, shachat, yachad, your mind should be disturbed by this absolutely agnostic call. Hello, dear believers, faithful Jews. 
God created both the spring and the slaughter. He is responsible for both. We cannot congratulate and pray and say thanks for the spring if we do not recognize that the same God brought upon us the slaughter. And then that sentence that will be quoted in every other future terrible killing of Jews while the world was watching, while nature continued, while nobody called up, the slayer slew, the blossom burst, and it was a sunny weather. Everything happened while it seems that life went on normally. Again, this last line in the Hebrew, which in English you have a reversed order. In Hebrew you have first the sun, then the blossoming of the tree, and only then the slaughter. So, darcha, parcha, shochet, shachat. That is a quote as famous as the one about not seeking vengeance. And we take a deep breath and we continue with Bialik. You remember the tone? You remember the address? The poetic voice, the narrator voice is talking to the reader and commanding us not to look the other way, but to follow him and the camera. Descend then to the cellars of the town, there where the virginal daughters of thy folk were fouled where seven heathen flung a woman down, the daughter in the presence of her mother, the mother in presence of her daughter, before slaughter, during slaughter, and after slaughter. Touch with thy hand the cushion stain, touch the pillow in curtain. This is the place, the wild ones of the wood, the beasts of the field, with bloody axes in their paws, compel thy daughter's yield, beast and swiped. One would often ask, did Bialik really have to go to so much detail? First, first of all, it's one of the first time ever in Jewish literature, and maybe in universal literature, that we have such a detailed description of rape, forceful rape, before slaughter, during slaughter, and after slaughter. When researchers will finally open the Bialik notebooks, you will see that every single one of these lines is based on a testimony of what had happened. But if you think that that is the big pain and that is the big anger of Bialik, hold with me, continue with me to see where he is taking this terrible description. וראה גם ראה באפלת אותה זווית. I want you here to listen to the Hebrew. You have to. ראה גם ראה, because the English note also do not fail to note. To me, does not have the strength of ראה גם ראה, see and see. In that dark corner and behind that cask crouched husbands bridegrooms, brothers, peering from the crack, watching the sacred bodies struggling underneath the bestial breath, stifled in filth and swallowing in their, their blood, watching from the darkness and its mesh, the lecherous rabble portioning for booty their kindred and their flesh. Crushed in their shame, they saw it all. They did not steer nor move. They did not pluck their eyes out. They beat not their brains against the wall. Perhaps, perhaps, each watcher had it in his heart to pray. Hang on for the prayer. I need to highlight. This is what we need to see. Crutched husbands, bridegrooms, brother, brothers peering from the cracks. And then a detailed description of what they should have done and didn't do. I would like to suggest that this is not a shift only in the poem. This is a shift in history. This is a shift in Jewish attitude totally represented by Bialik the Zionist, if you wish, 
the Bialik who is not calling upon heavens anymore as he did in the previous poem. The Bialik who is not asking for the world to address the issue. Bialik is very clear and explicit here. Jewish man, where were you? How could you allow this to happen? How could you hide while this was happening to your kindred? And let us see how he continues because he doesn't shy away from continuing. What did they ask for? Ribbono shel olam asenes ve'elai hara'a lo tavo. Let us go back to the line before. Perhaps, perhaps each watcher had it in his heart to pray. Oh, a miracle, O oh Lord, and spare my skin this day. Those who survived this foulness, who from their blood awoke, beheld their life polluted, the light of their world gone out, how did their menfolk bear it? How did they bear this yoke? They crawled forth from their holes. They fled to the house of the Lord. They offered thanks to him. The sweet benedictory word, the Kohanim sailed forth to the rabbi house they flitted. Tell me, O oh rabbi, tell, and is my own wife permitted? The matter ends and nothing more, and all is as it was before. If you do not remember anything from the city of killing, the city of slaughter, you want to remember this particular section, the description of what Jewish men were doing. First of all, they pray that the evil bestowed on their women does not reach them. Then those who survived, the women whose life was totally destroyed inside and out, and the light of their world gone out, we know about raped women. By the way, this is a very early male voice acknowledging that it's not enough to survive physically a rape, that something is totally destroyed in a woman who was raped. Did we hear about that earlier? We, were, well, we would hear about killing. We would hear about death, and then there were those who survived. Bialik, for one of the earliest times, speaks up, speaks out for what happened to the women. And what do the men do? They are running to the synagogue to say Hagomel, to offer a prayer. And they are even, you know, full of gratitude for the miracle of having survived. And on top of all that, the Kohanim, they will rush to the rabbi and ask, and rabbi, after she was raped, am I, is she allowed to me? Can you even start imagining those women whose husbands need to find an answer whether they can go back to their marital life, whether the husband can still offer some love, a hug, in spite of everything that happened. No, even that is not something that women can trust or hope to happen for them. Bialik is really opening, and look at what had happened. We are not looking anymore at the terrible acts of the Cossacks. We are looking within the Jewish community. Let us continue. Everything goes back to normal, right? We survived, yet another program. Let's go back to life. Okay, continue with Bialik because we need to continue. Come now and I will bring thee to their layers. The privies, jacks and uh, pig pens, where the hairs of the Hasmoneans lay with trembling knees, concealed and cowering, the sons of the Maccabees, the seed of saints, the sins of the lions, who crumb by scores in all the sanctuaries of their shame, so sanctified my name, 
It was the flight of mice they fled. The scurrying of roaches was their flight. They died like dogs and they were dead. We are a very short time before Hanukkah and we need to look at the Bialik imagery when he mocks the cowardice of man during the Kishinev pogrom, he will use the metaphor, are these the sons of the Hashmonees? Are these the sons of the Maccabees? Those of us younger people, maybe even the less young like myself, know that the main date in the Jewish calendar to celebrate independence and sovereignty for 75 odd years now is the Yom Atzmaut, the day of Israel's dependence, independence. But before we come to the state of Israel, the major holiday of fighting for your state and fighting for your right is Hanukkah. That is the absolute simile. That is the absolute metaphor. And look what happened to us. Our forefathers knew how to fight for their right, knew how to fight and sacrifice for their people. And what happened to us? We are dying like dogs. Can you already discern where I am taking you? With the language of looking at how Jews survive or not survive, a language which will develop after the Holocaust, the language of quote-unquote sheep to the slaughter, can find its roots here. There is something in us, the victims, that needs resetting. Let us continue with Bialik. We are almost done. Beyond the suburbs go and reach the burial ground. Let no man see thy going. Attain the place alone, a place of sainted graves and martyr stone. Stand on the fresh torn soil. Such silence will take hold of these. Thy heart will flay, will fail with pain and shame. Yet I will let no tear fall from shine eye. Though thou wilt long to be low like the driven ox, to bellow like the driven ox, that bellows and before the altar balks, I will make hard thy heart, yea, I will not permit a sigh. Stay for a minute and think about this image of visiting the place of slaughter and swearing not to weep but to be different in face of the place of slaughter, in place and facing the place of burial, Bialik calls for hardening of hearts, for avoiding crying, avoiding weeping. And he will conclude, now he turns to them, to the victims. It's not anymore a commandment for you, the reader, to go see. Now Bialik is speaking to all of us. I grieve for you, my children. My heart is sad for you. Your dead were vainly dead, and neither I nor you know why you died or wherefore, for whom nor what laws. Your death are without reason. Your lives are without cause. What says the Shekhinah? In the cloud it hides in shame, in agony, alone abides. And you can continue reading the Bialik as he is anger erupts. Avant ye beggars to the carnal house, the bones of your fathers disenter. Cram them within your knapsack, bear them on your shoulders and go forth to do your business with these precious wares at all the country fairs. Stop on the highway near some populous city and spread your filthy rags. Bialik is calling shame on those who will collect only sad stories and will ask for the pity of the goyim. So you will conjure up the pity of the nations, 
And so their sympathy implore, for you are now as you have been of your, and as you stretch your hand, so you will you stretch it. And as you have been wretched, so are you wretched. And look at the Bialik language. He's using a Yiddish word, snoring, begging for help. There is a terrible call. What is thy business here, O son of man? I have no place here anymore. Rise to the desert flee. I think this will be a good moment for me to leave the Bialik poem and thank you, take you to some conclusions as we are reaching the end of this class. The cup of afflictions thither bear with thee. Talk thou to thy soul, render it in many as a shred, with impotent rage thy heart deform. Thy tear upon the barrier boulders shed, and send thy bitter cry into the storm. Bialik is calling for rising up, for going to the desert, for not accepting that this is what has to happen, for not calling for the help of the nations, for not snoring and snoring. Can you now see how from these two poems, upon the slaughter, ala shchita, and for sure, be'ira riga, comes a language that points a finger to the victim. Comes a language that criticizes the responsibility of the Jews, or rather the lack of assuming responsibility to what is happening to them. Would it be extremely surprising to you to think and see how one of the first defense Jewish organizations is born immediately upon this. Would it be surprising for you to recognize in later years how criticism of Holocaust victims will go back to this language and talk about like sheep and to the slaughter, and admire the uprising, the partisans, the ghetto fighters, much more than lamenting the death of the victims? With these two poems, Bialik, I think, lays the foundations for a language that had become so much part of Israeli lore and not only Israeli lore. Not shedding tears, standing up for yourself, not calling for the help of others, but rather doing your own thing in defending your country. Next to it, not only is there a call for defense, not only there is a criticism of the traditional behavior, but there is also a call that we will see resonate in later Israeli lore, and that is to hold your tears, not to cry. Modern Israeli culture took a long time, and I'm not sure it's there yet, to allow expressions of weeping and crying. You can go to the 80s and see an Israeli pop song that talks about Hagvarim Bochim Balayla, men only cry at night. You can go to novels talking about the wars of the state of Israel and they will describe the agony of a bereaved mother and the utmost compliment would be the ima lo hizila dim'a and the mother did not shed even a tear. We are, as we are accompanying Bialik in 1903 with Upon the Slaughter and in 1904 with the City of Killing, standing on a seam line. Not that people, there is never a case when somebody is totally the first one. There must have been already voices like this. Bialik is not alone, but his voice is the strong one. His voice is the one that will be heard. His voice is the one that will be quoted and repeated and taught to generations of Jews to come. So if again you are seeking with me the reason of what makes a national poet, 
Well, even if he did not witness the birth of the State of Israel, even if he did not witness the Holocaust, he created the language that will be used and used time and again because he gave us the 20th century lamentations. And this is why I call this second session the session of lamentations. Our third session next week, I promise, will be much more fun. We will be looking at presence, Bialik in contemporary Israeli life through Shabbat Abelka, or as some people know it, Hachama Merosha Ilanot Istelka, the sun had moved away from the tip of top of the trees. Take me under your wings, Hachnisini, which had become a wedding song in Israel, and one of the many Bialik children's songs that are say, still sung for, to this day. So bear with me and come back and be with us next week. And until then, Thank you so much for being with us on this very difficult session. Thank you very much.